You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke, That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I'm David George Brooke, your host, where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect a deeper dive into gratitude's immense power, a gratitude tip of the show, or maybe a gratitude nugget, how you can become a gratitude believer, and maybe one to three takeaways from today's show. My podcast is available every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, Google, and anywhere else where you receive and get your podcast. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. Thank you so much for that. And also to purchase a gratitude journal or to find out more about my gratitude speaking, group coaching, or one-on-one coaching, you can connect with me at thatgratitudeguy.com. So let me get on to the show and introduce my guest. This particular guest, I'm going to read you a little background I've known for just several years. We'll find out about that in a second. Mr. Mark Davis. Mark Davis is reputation for providing creative investment solutions and trustee counsel to help high net worth individuals and their family is well known in Seattle. His work as a a tax CPA with Deloitte and Ernst and Young uh, armed him with a clear understanding of the federal and the state tax implications and their impact on investment planning and generational estate tax transfer strategies. Previously, Mr. Davis was the marketing director of Allen Biller and Associates, a global institutional investment consulting firm. At Citibank, he was responsible for developing new right relationships for lending, investment, and trust services. Prior to that, he founded and is chairman emeritus of Share Builder Corporation slash Capital One Investing. Mr. Davis is a co-founder and president of the Seattle Philanthropic Advisor Network, aka SPAN, whose mission is to help advisors lead clients who have philanthropic intent to be more impactful. He is a 30 plus year member of Seattle Rotary number four. So I'm going to tell, uh, well, first of all, Mark, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, David George Brooke. Great to be here. Great to have you. Well, I will tell you, I always start off every podcast to give people a context, and this is especially fun one for me. Tell the listeners how and when you and I met. I think it was 45 years ago, and we were both in the so. clothing business, and uh, I was I was involved with a company called FGF up in Northgate, and you were running Butch Blum, a much better quality clothing store in Seattle. And we met then and uh, continue to talk on a regular basis since then, 45 years ago. Gosh, and you know, nowadays, it's kind of like people, I'd say, how long have you been with the company? And they go, I've been there a long time. I've been there four months. And I go like, what's, so how is four months with a company or a friendship, like a 45 year friendship? So, so as you look back, I was, as we were reading your bio, Talk to me a little bit about how, and knowing you as well as I do is a huge advantage, especially on a podcast like this, but how has gratitude kind of played a part in your life and sort of mindset? I've always looked at you as an extremely positive outlook, always with a smile on your face and so forth. So how has it played a role in your life? Well, it's sort of the um, backbone of what my life is. I mean, I'm very grateful for not only, you know, the opportunities that I've, that have either presented or that I've, I've thought about taking on, but also the fact that family has entered into that in a way that really is all about gratitude and that we're grateful for each other. We're grateful for that uh, planning in the future that we're looking to do together. And not only that, the um, fact of how we can help each other with things that they're, they're trying to accomplish. So uh, I've been very grateful over the years for a lot of legacy type um, things that have happened in my life through my family. And um, it just prevails in everything I do. And speaking of which, uh, tell the listeners about your family. You have quite an impressive family, in my opinion. Well, yeah, the extended family is really the family that, you know, with, with Alicia and William that um, are off on, a, on both very successful careers. Your two children. Yes, two children, Alicia and William. And uh, in fact, we're going to have a week with them next week down in the British Virgin Islands. That'll be very fun together. Uh, Finally able to travel offshore. 
but uh, very, very proud of them and very proud of what they've accomplished and the things that they're currently working on to um, continue to uh, push the limits. So, mm -hmm. and of course my wife has been very successful in her business ventures. No matter what it is she's taken on, uh, she's taken on with a lot of passion and it's always turned out to be a good outcome. So yeah, you, you there. I would describe for those that don't know you, uh, which reminds me once I was at Seattle Rotary and I said to somebody, do you know Mark Davis? And they said, who doesn't? So I can, I can strive for that someday. That's my goal. Have you ever heard of the gratitude guy? No, no. Why should I have? So it's really good. But you, you two make a tremendously uh, powerful couple of what you've accomplished in your life and what Louisa has. And of course with Alicia and William as well. Uh, how's kind of gratitude been a factor in a long marriage with you with Louisa? I think it's really uh, common goals. I think we've been very um, clear on, you know, what we're looking to accomplish and how we can either, you know, change or tweak that uh, goal to a way that really is something that we take on together or um, don't do it, you know, unless we're going to do it together, we really haven't taken it on. So it's having that support uh, by her for my goals and me for her goals that we um, continue to stay in our own lane, but we'd certainly support each other as we um, accomplish those goals. So we're very clear on goals that we're looking to accomplish and whether that be, you know, spending more time with the family. One of the, one of the things that uh, she said recently to me, Mark, is, is, you know, we can, we can get these kids off to vacation, but it's, it's, it's a lot easier if we pay for it. <laughs> That's good. And I like that. I would just make some notes. Um, you and Louisa and a long marriage and, and Alicia and William and so on common goals, which you tweak along the way, uh, sort of stay in your same lane. Uh, it's, it's one of my favorite questions coming up, which I just don't know if I always get an answer. Maybe sometimes the answer is, I don't know, but you're both so motivated and both Alicia and William are very motivated and inspiring. Where do you think the motivation came for you in your life? Where do you think it came from? And maybe speculate and answer maybe where it came from for uh, Louisa. Well, certainly our parents. I think our parents were both very uh, clear on the things that they wanted to do with the family, uh, things that were important to them. And I think Louisa shared that same common bond with and, and outlook with her parents, very, very similar in, in how much level of risk they wanted to take. And then also, um, you know, not going too far over their skis. So, mm. you know, we, we've taken on things that we think are important. And with that was uh, the courage to do that uh, through what we saw our parents able to accomplish. Mm -hmm. So it, it was really that, that ability to not only be encouraged by them, but also be um, clear on what it is we want to accomplish. And, mm -hmm. and we do that really by writing our goals down and looking at them on a daily basis. And, and what happens in that process is your, is your, uh, uh, subconscious mind kicks in and all of a sudden you're seeing opportunities that that goal is presenting itself to accomplish so you can uh, accomplish it. So goal setting is a huge part of how we run our life. Uh, and that, right, and right. that was instilled in our parent from our parents and what they did. And I think about that too. A lot of times people answer that question with their parents, uh, grandparents, a professor, a teacher, a coach. There's various people, sometimes a boss, sometimes it is inspired people. But I always think I like the term birth lottery because so often when people talk about their parents, it's that's just what we did. We win the birth lottery. Did we get some good, good parents that cared about us? And, you know, you see these stories all the time about people that abuse their children and so forth. And I wonder how I would have been if I was in that situation. I certainly had a good childhood. And so it makes a big difference. But so in, in terms and, and, of and, and oh, just ahead. to add just to add to that, mm -hmm. you know, my dad did study goal setting. So he did. Mm. Um, really believe in it and, and instill that in me. And, you know, by, by those looking at your goals every day, all of a sudden, you know, you, you realize you can just accomplish a whole lot more if you visually write it down, like you do with your gratitude journal. Mm -hmm. If you write down the goal, there's a really good chance if you look at that goal every day, that that will be something that you'll be able to do. Well, and one, one, one of my favorite stories on that was, I don't know how many of you watching have ever caught a salmon but it's something that I had never done in Seattle, uh, mm -hmm. even though we live in salmon country. Mm -hmm. So I was with some old high school friends of mine 
in my in my mid 30s and one of the friends had gone up to Alaska and was running an Alaskan uh, fish processing company up in Pelican, Alaska. And he said, hey, why would you guys like to come to Alaska next year and go off salmon fishing? And I think if I hadn't written that goal down and had looked at it every day for two or three years, when I started my goal setting process, I might have said, ah, oh, no, I don't, I don't have time to do that. But the fact that I had seen it every day for three or four years, I said, that I would is, love to do that. So That is a good point. And there's more and more study, and I'd bring, I'd bring this up in my talks and different modules about the power of writing something down. And we have all these now you can speak and, you know, send a book to Mark Davis and it types it up for you and you can type on the keyboard and so forth. But there's something about this writing instrument, this pen and a piece of paper, make sure to call Mark Davis and let him know so on that just plants it in your brain that much better. And I know I've mentioned to the listeners in the last couple of podcasts about taking this RV trip with my son. And, and uh, we first planned it 15 years ago when he was uh, uh, 12 years, 15 years ago. Yeah. When he was uh, 12. And it was, it took 15 years, but I always had it written down and it was always there. And then at some point you change that into an action of doing something. Well, let's pick a date. That's the first thing. Let's get it on the calendar. Then let's make some reservations for air travel or an RV in this case or whatever. But and write on my gratitude journal, that gratitude guys, daily gratitude journal. It says, if you think about it, it's like a dream. If you talk about it, it inspires you. But if you write about it, it empowers you. And then there's something about that that's just really, really important because it is in there and it's being written. So, so speaking of other things from the past, I mentioned this in the bio. Uh, tell the listeners a little bit about SPAN because I think that's just something that was really cool that you kind of spearheaded and give them a little bit of the story on the Seattle Philanthropic Network. I believe it's um, the acronym. Yeah, thank you, David, for asking for that uh, information. So back in 2007, uh, the um, government allowed this new form of charitable giving called a donor advised fund, which actually is something that can be done in lieu of a, a private foundation. And it caused a lot of confusion because people had traditionally done a foundation in their giving. So this new um, entity arrived and, and I talked with my friend Paul Shoemaker and he said, well, maybe we should have a have a luncheon with some people that uh, would be interested in learning more about how people are going about their giving. And we'll invite the Brainerd family, you know, Paul and Debbie to come talk about how they do their giving uh, through Islandwood and other organizations that they have founded. So during the luncheon, uh, we're wondering if we'd even have a second one. We had about 130 people attend at the WAC and uh, it was very well attended by attorneys and CPAs and lawyers that work with families that are working on charitable legacy. And one of the questions was asked of Debbie, um, how do you work with your children and your philanthropy? I mean, what do you, do you involve them or not? And she said, well, we really don't have children. So philanthropy is our child. Mm. And if we meet an advisor for the first time and they don't uh, hug us in that first meeting, then we will probably never do business with them. Oh, wow. And Paul looked over at me and said, Mark, I think we're onto something here. Wow. Wow. So from then, we, we, our next one was Bill Gates Sr. and then Jeff Rakes and Scott Oakey and many of the Microsoft people that have been so philanthropic in our community. Uh, I've been featured as speakers and we do have a listing of those and videos of all of those speeches, except the first one, because we weren't sure if we were going to actually do it again. And uh, so we have about 38 videos on SpanSeattle.org. And we've got a couple coming up. We have um, Howard Wright and his wife, Kate Janway, speaking to us in October. And then uh, Howard and Sherry Schultz in December. So we've got a couple good uh, span lunches coming up. And probably we will still be on Zoom until next year. But it's been really interesting to learn from them firsthand how they work with advisors and, more importantly, why they select the charities that they support. Excellent. And... You just mentioned this. So I'll put it in the show notes. The um, uh, URL is spanseattle.org. Is the, the correct one? Okay, because I know it's, yes. I, just, I was drawing a blank on the A, but it's Seattle Philanthropic Advisors Network is the acronym. Correct. 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 Yeah. No, that's been, and I've been to a couple of those luncheons. And boy, I, I, one of the biggest takeaways I had is not only were the speakers great, but so often when you get in a group like that, you know, everybody you meet at the table is just somebody special. And it's like no, no duds are allowed almost, it seems like it, because everybody has something to say, and it's really neat. And I was thinking when you said 
um, I don't know if that was Paul Brainerd, you said that said it, but philanthropy was our child. And I thought, what a great thing for a person. Uh, I have two sons, you have a son and a daughter and a son. And I know a lot, I have quite a few friends that don't have children. And what a great thing to have for you be, be able to con, uh, contribute rather is, is phil be philanthropic. What a, what a neat, I'm going to remember that because I think that's really neat. And it's almost to find out because occasionally I'd run into some people that don't have any children. And there is just a bit, little bit of a leaning towards pretty self-focused. And when you don't have your kids and you and I put so much time and did raising our children and they're uh, fortunately all four of them are quite successful, which we're very blessed to, to know that. But what a neat thing for somebody to channel that energy into that doesn't have kids too. So speaking of channeling energy, I, I like, we haven't talked about this in a long time, but I think the listeners might be interested. Talk a little bit about your ShareBuilder Capital One experience, because I thought that was really kind of a neat, I thought that taught you some good lessons that might be of interest to the listeners. Oh, it did. Yeah. And I was pretty early on in the internet. Uh, one of the things I learned at University of Washington was that uh, through a guy named Vernon Buck, who was one of my favorite professors there was, Mark, it's always better to have a good distribution channel than a good product. Mm. And when I learned of the internet through Marty Rood, a good friend of mine through Rotary, who was selling cars on the internet, um, it became very clear to me that there's only one thing better than distributing a car on the internet, and that's something that you don't have to actually deliver, mm. which is a stock. So stocks are already digital. Uh, we set up a direct stock purchase plan online service for direct stock purchase plans to be offered on the internet. And then that evolved into a brokerage that we allowed people to purchase stocks, not only on the internet, but actually through their bank account on a monthly basis. Wow. So it was a very um, interesting uh, opportunity at the time. People were very <clears throat> skeptical as to whether or not the internet would be something that would be around because just like everything, if something's new, maybe it's not gonna last. But as right. we learn, uh, the internet, thank God that COVID happened uh, now and not 10 years ago, because we wouldn't be able to have these kind of face-to-face -face opportunities like we're able to do with Zoom. So we're, we're once again, relying on technology to help us through some of these challenges. And in the end, with ShareBuilder, uh, the, the benefit really was to the investor. Because before that, they were paying a lot of money and commissions to buy and sell stock. And as you know, today, it's free. If you want to yeah. buy a stock, it's free. Exactly. And in the old days, um, back when I was at Merrill Lynch, to buy 2,000 shares of a stock, it cost you $2,000. Mm -hmm. Today, mm -hmm. that's free. Yeah. So it brings everybody into the market in a way that has been very, very good for not only the investor, but for the companies. Excellent. And that, and that was ultimately sold to Capital One, correct? Uh, initially, ING, then Capital One, and um, currently E-Trade owns it. Oh, okay. Now it's E-Trade. Excellent. So another one I was kind of, I'm just noting the number of things that you've had an impact on in your life. And again, I always like to think the lessons that are learned or the, the gratefulness that you got out of that or the perspective that you gained or whatever. And I noticed they all kind of start with S because they're span and then they're share builder. And then I've got a couple more S's coming up here too. Uh, talk to the listeners a little bit about Seattle Rotary, because that's something that you've had a huge impact on. And it impacted me. I was a member for a number of years and just, again, phenomenal speakers, phenomenal people. That's where the person said, who doesn't know Mark Davis? And I said, I think I'm hooked <laughs> up with the right guy. But uh, again, tell the listeners a little bit about the Rotary experience and specifically Seattle Rotary number four. Thank you, David. Well, you know, again, back to my dad. Uh, my dad was a member of University of Rotary. And he said, if you join Seattle Rotary, which I hope you do, uh, be sure to never miss a meeting. So I didn't. I didn't miss a meeting uh, until we went on to Zoom. And I guess I've, I've missed a meeting. But for 35 years, um, I attended Rotary every week, downtown Seattle. If I wasn't in Seattle, I would make up at other clubs. And it was a huge part of uh, not only uh, some of the success I've had in my career, but more importantly, in the, in the people I've known and the people I've, I've brought into Rotary. I believe that one of the things that, like with you, David, uh, sharing Rotary with somebody and then seeing if they want to join and to add to the the color and the support and the impact that Rotary can make is something that's been really important to me. Uh, some of my most important friendships have been developed not only 
by new people that have joined Rotary, but people that were there. And it happens because you're seeing that person. When, whenever I tell people about Rotary, they're like, you mean you actually meet every week? <laughs> 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 yes, we do. So we're the fourth, fourth oldest Rotary Club in the world. Like I like to say, we're the fourth oldest and the number one Rotary Club in the world. And um, we're that way because of, you know, some of the things that uh, have been part of that legacy started in 2000 or 1909. Wow. Uh, speakers like Nelson Mandela spoke at one point, Billy Graham, Oprah Winfrey. And we con continue to try to have top flight speakers every week address current issues that our members might be interested in. So I'm very grateful to be a longtime member of Seattle Rotary and continue to support new people uh, getting involved. And certainly younger people is part of our mission as we, as we go into this next decade. But actually our membership of Seattle Rotary grew this year during the during the COVID oh, wow. time. Mm. So it's it's been um, something that really does bring people together on a weekly basis. Yeah, that's neat. And never missing a meeting. You said when it went to Zoom that you'd actually maybe missed one at one point, but that's pretty amazing for all those years. I think your dad's advice was really right. And and I think, as I mentioned, going to the meetings and you would invite me, then I became a member at Seattle 4 and um, through Pacific Institute. And I just remember saying, well, I'll, I'll sit with my friend, Mark, but then I, and you'd have a guest or something, which was fantastic. Another guest of some sorts, so I'd go sit at a table, get there early, and then it would fill in with nine other people. And I'd get to know nine new people. And every one of them was, uh, in fact, it was funny. I think it was uh, Stan Foster, if I'm not mistaken. And I said, gosh, I've just, I've, I've never met a, ba a bad person. I've never met a dud. He goes, well, apparently you, apparently you haven't met everybody. And I went, wait, hold on a second. I think everybody's cool. And, and Rotary, uh, not just mo uh, as much Seattle, although I spoke there in October of last year, but Rotary in general was fantastic for me for my speaking because it gave me such a platform to go out to, I believe the district is 5030 in Washington. And I think I've spoken at virtually all of the chapters. And uh, once again, not only in my talk about gratitude, but also just about meeting wonderful people that want to give back to the community. There's something back. It's, that's why I think that's neat about philanthropy, philanthropy, philanthropy was our child is so cool because giving back is really what it kind of comes down to. And in my talks and people will ask me afterwards, you know, so is it, you know, do you make a lot of money? Do you sell a lot of books or whatever somebody might ask? And I said, you know, I just want to impact lives. And if I can change one person today and have them understand how gratitude mindset can redirect your life or reform it or refocus. Uh, I've been successful. And so it's been, Rotary was just a really, really great thing. And and one thing well, and, I wanted- And, and, you, and David, you did, you did leave out that you spoke at our district conference. Oh, that's in true. Vancouver with, with Ezra to show me that's on the right. power of gratitude. And that yeah. was uh, probably one of the best district conferences we've ever had. And I really believe that your impact of, of your message there was, was part of that. So- Oh, thank you. thank you. Thank you. And I remember notably- uh, meeting Bill Gates's dad, who spoke there as well, too, which was really neat. And Ezra to show me, as you mentioned, and just once again, a lot of nice people. And it's just, it, it's funny. It's, it, and I think back on companies I've worked for, like Lowe's as a store manager, Nordstrom. Yeah, you met a lot of nice people. Those are pretty high quality, especially Nordstrom was a high quality company. But gosh, with Rotary, it was pretty. It was pretty hard to find a dud because there, everybody was just really people that really cared and and maybe wanted to give back was maybe the biggest mantra of all. So, speaking of, uh, I'm going to get to one last S that is something that's come up after uh, Span and Seattle Rotary and Sharebuilder is CBEC. And I'm not sure all the listeners might know about CBEC, but because I'm going to be speaking there within the month towards the end of last week of July, I'll be a guest speaker there for the week of camp. Tell the listeners about CBEC, because I don't know if everybody would know. I've mentioned who, uh, several people I'm going to be speaking. Some knew, some didn't. So again, tell the listeners a little bit about CBEC and your experience there. Sure, sure. Well, it was a big impact, made a huge impact on our family over the years, because again, it wasn't something that we did every week but it's something that we did every year. So starting when I think I was eight years old, our family would make our trip over to Seabeck when it was run by the YMCA and then we broke it away. But it is a, and started our own nonprofit called Seabeck Family. But um, it's a conference ground over on, on the beautiful Hood Canal, just over from Silverdale. And there's a meeting house and then a bunch of outhouses that people stay in that are around sort of the meeting the main meeting house. And there are tennis courts and, and all kinds of activities to do. But when, when, once again, it's about family time together. 
So every every week for seven days, there's you know singing after the meals, and there's a lot of fellowship, and then there's a program such as the one you're going to be speaking at, which is adult education. So you know Dale Turner and Pepper Schwartz and lots of people have been over doing this adult education that you always come away with and say, geez, I, I, I've had seven days of education on a topic that I really hadn't thought much about. Mm -hmm. And I think the people that do go to CBEC are generally grateful people for the, the time they're together as well as for their family. But to really highlight that when you're there speaking this coming month, David, will be, I think, a real highlight over the years of, of the speakers of that kind of quality and message that you'll deliver. Oh, thank you. And it, it will be all around gratitude. In fact, kind of the title of my, I don't know if I have a title for five days of education, but my newest title or most updated title is maximizing your gratitude attitude. And I think in the last year or two, as I did a lot of Zoom meetings uh, because of the pandemic, I had navigating the new normal. I had, you know, uh, getting through the pandemic and using gratitude to help you and so forth. And I think now we're kind of through it. And I think people want to get move past the, the words COVID-19 and pandemic and, and uh, coronavirus and things like that. So, but maximizing your gratitude attitude is really uh, just an important, I just hopefully will give them a lot of tools and things uh, to, to take forward. And certainly the gratitude journal is one of them. And, and so speaking of tools, and we'll wrap up in about four or five minutes, but I just want to, I want to have you pass on to the listeners. Again, I look at you and Louisa individually, as well as together as two very close friends of mine. And you mentioned goal setting, but what would be Mark Davis's um, kind of a good takeaway, if you will, maybe those five or 10 steps of things that you should do every day or that are good reminders. You mentioned the goal setting, I think is tremendous and specifically writing it down. But if somebody came up to you and said, so everybody's heard of you before, it, everybody seems to know Mark Davis, give me some advice or give me a tip. What would you tell people for maybe those four or five or six things or whatever it is to do every day or kind of have as a guide for them to be successful? I guess to try to be an encourager, you know, and, and, and there's an old story that Dale Turner told about the um, devil who decided to finally go out of business. And so the the, the tools that he had that I've written down here, stealing, lying, prejudice, greed, hatred. These are all different tools that the devil uses. But the one tool that he said he would never sell was discouragement. Mm. Because if he could discourage somebody, then he could beat him every time. So the one tool he held back in case he ever wanted to go back into business oh, how was funny. discouragement. And I, I believe that. I believe that if you can encourage, whether it's a, a child, a peer, an adult, to take on that dream, that uh, you're going to be very helpful to them because, you know, you, you need encouragement in your life. And I think gratitude ties into that. So uh, try to be an encourager would be my, my takeaway. And the other S that I'd like to just take a note of is my two sisters. I've been very fortunate to have two great sisters. Um, I'm not sure what my life would be, what my life would be like if I had a brother, because I didn't have a brother. Mm -hmm. But uh, I consider you a brother, David. But Absolutely. when it comes to um, my two sisters, I've been very grateful to have two loving sisters in my life. I think we're clearly two brothers from two different mothers. I think that's I think kind so. of the, as the line goes and so on. But that's a good point too, because, and that's something I think is really. I don't know if I'd say sad. It's just different. When I was growing up, the average family size was four, five, or six kids. We had families that had six and seven children. And I came from three brothers and a sister. There was five of us. And gosh, nowadays, I mean, the average family size is about one and a half. I mean, it's just, it's too bad because siblings play a, a, a great role. And not only that, but you have a twin sister too, which is another um, yeah. sort of aspect that's kind of cool. So so be an encourager. So I'm going to write down just one or two things as takeaways for the listeners today. Uh, anything, anything more on the goal setting aspect? Because again, I look back at your success and Louise's writing the goals down, tweaking them, as you said, uh, talking about the relationship. You guys had common goals. I really like that. Stay in your own lane. Any other advice around goal setting? I think, I think with goal setting too, is to keep it very uh, fluid. You know, you, you start your year off with all the goals that you want to accomplish that year. But when goals enter in that you want to add to it, you got to be sure to write those new goals down. 
And then if a goal is no longer important and you realize, hey, I'm no longer working at Ernst & Young, I guess I don't want to be a partner there, mm. you cross it out. Mm -hmm. But it's not one that you've accomplished. So be flexible. So check off the ones that you've accomplished, cross out the ones that are no longer important. And then the ones that come up that you want to accomplish, be sure to write those down because when you write them down, you will accomplish them. I'm just going to put, it. keep updating too. That's just kind of like the, I think of those, those airline things, the old days in Europe where they go and the, the new line, the new flights would line up and move to the top and you'd hear all that rattling and all that kind of thing. And it's kind of like, so you want to keep it updated and so on. And yeah, so, and when, you, and, and when you move them from one year to the next, yeah, carry over those ones that you haven't accomplished. That's right. Still important. Exactly. Just like you. that that yes. RV trip I mentioned is that got carried over for a number of years, and and last thing too on the on just the be an encourager, goal setting, keep it fluid, keep updating, and so forth. And you mentioned your parents, but I've always been just totally impressed with not only you but your attitude always a smile on your face, always a positive, always a kind word to say. And what would you, how would you tell people to kind of be mindful of that in their daily life? I think it's the spirit of God that moves mm. through you. I really do. It's, it's believing in prayer and it's believing in those that, that are struggling and how you can help them, you know, get through that struggle. Because as, as you mentioned with ShareBuilder, I learned a lot in, in that struggle. That's so right. As you, as you have to change and move from what the original idea was, you need to be able to be flexible. That's right. So yeah, you did learn some lessons there. And I think it's interesting because I've spoken in a number of churches and am spiritual. And then I've gone to corporations and they go, well, now you're not going to talk about God, right? And I go, well, you know, I guess if you don't want me to. And, and yet I make references too, as I said, I think that I think God gives you the toolbox, but I think he wants you to build the house. I think that's one of the things that is kind of important. So, you know, it's like, or I've said to coaching clients or people is that I'll be your training wheels, but I'm not pedaling your bike. So you, there's a couple of things you got to take some responsibility. So I think faith, I love to ask people, what was your best coping mechanism through anything? And, and I know you had some, uh, just as an example in ShareBuilder, you had some frustrating things happen to you there. And then some other things in life that both you and Louise went through. Well, what was the best coping mechanism? And so often faith is one of them and then having that gratitude mindset and that writing in that gratitude journal every single day takes five minutes and I just tell people all the time and pushing this point five minutes to focus on what you have versus what you don't have and as I excuse me as I've said so many times gratitude turns what you have into enough so it's really it's really neat to to be able to impact people and show them there is a way of thinking uh, unlike my own father, who was very negative and would always say things like, I'd say, good morning. He'd go, what's good about it? And I just, I never understood that, or it's a beautiful day in uh, Seattle. He goes, it's going to rain tomorrow. And I just, I, I just, I never understood that line of thinking because every day we get out of bed, you have a choice to make the left side of the bed or the right side of the bed, positive or negative, up, down, left, right, grateful, ungrateful. It's any of those things you get to decide and nobody can make that choice for you. So so any final takeaway for the listeners? You know, Mr. I, Davis? I, I couldn't agree more. I think the positive attitude is an extremely important part of this. I think getting nine hours sleep is very, yes, important. very good. I think it's important to recharge your battery every day and, and by giving yourself enough sleep to do that. But being around people that are positive makes you even more positive. So yeah, I totally I've, agree. I've, one of the things I've appreciated about Rotary and the places I've worked as well as, um, our friendship. Yeah, you bet. Absolutely. And you are known by the company you keep. And one of the things I'll wrap up on this is I think it's so important because you mentioned um, uh, helping people be an encourager is your exact words. And I do an exercise called the association evaluator. And what it asks people to do is think about one, maybe two people in your life that you want to disassociate with that aren't necessarily mentally healthy for you. One or two people that maybe you want to limit your associations with because it's okay, but it's just not the most positive experience, but you just maybe see them, but not as much. And number three, one or two people you want to uh, expand your association with. I think all is over the years, I think Gosh, how come I haven't done, you know, I haven't called Mark for a while. I need to keep in touch with these people that inspire me. And number four is one or two people that you, you either want to mentor or have them mentor you. And I had some phenomenal mentors in my life. You've been a mentor to me on many things. And then I've had the opportunity to mentor people myself. And it's just 
one of the best things of all. So that uh, I think one of the biggest tidbits I'm going to take away or tips, if you will, is be an encourager. I like that exact word. So I hope all of you listeners pay attention to that. Encourage people when they fall down, help them to get up. So, so that's it for today's episode. Mark, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you, David, for asking me. Great, to, great to be with you. You bet. You too. And, and my podcast is available every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, Google, and so forth. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear, and I appreciate that. To purchase a gratitude journal or to find out more about my gratitude speaking and coaching, you can connect with me at thatgratitudeguide.com. And then also, if you'd like to receive my Monday morning video, my Monday morning minute, rather, that I send out every Monday morning, Go to your text and text the number 22828. That's 22828 is the text number. And in the message box, put in gratitude guy and send that. And you'll get a link to get connected to that. And you'll get that video every Monday morning, about six in the morning Pacific time. So lastly, thank you for turning, tuning in. And until next time, I'm David George Brook, that gratitude guy. And remember, be grateful and never, never quit. quit. Never quit. So long. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us, and you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.